we're going to be taking a look at various forms of resolution uh, as it pertains to predicate logic. So first up, let's take a look at this one. It says, for any x, either p of x or q of x is true. a is a particular element for which q of a is false. Therefore, a is a particular element for which p of a must be true. That's really all it's saying, and intuitively it makes a good amount of sense. That's also basically how we're going to prove it, and let's just take a look at the two-column proof. So here we have it. Notice we begin by stating our two givens. We work our way towards our conclusion. The only trick is how are we going to get from lines 1 and 2 to line 4, and really the only missing step is universal instantiation of our given, where we replace every instance of x with a, and since this is a universal instantiation, we don't have to be particularly careful about which variable we use. And now that we have p of a or q of a, and one of our other givens was not q of a, we simply apply good old-fashioned resolution to get line 4, and we're done. Now let's take a look at an existential generalization version of that. For any x, either p of x or q of x is true. There is an element for which q of x is false, therefore there must be an element for which p of x is true. The proof is more or less the same as the last one, we just have to be slightly careful so we state our two givens, then we existentially instantiate this second given, replacing every x with a. Existential instantiation is a bit particular. We have to be careful that we are not using a variable that exists already, and we haven't. Okay? Lines 1 or 2 don't involve the variable a, so we're free to instantiate an existential statement using this variable. Then we do the universal instantiation. Universal instantiation doesn't particularly care what you do, so we can replace all the x's with a's in line 1, even though we have already used the variable a. Now that we have these two things, we can resolve them according to our standard usage, and now we can existentially generalize, replacing the a back with x. An existential generalization doesn't really care how you do it. But we cannot reverse these two lines. If we began with the universal instantiation, then in, uh, when we tried to do the existential instantiation, we'd have a variable that had already been used for something. Specifically, it was already used here. So line 3 and line 4 have to occur in this order. They cannot be reversed. Okay? As I've said in a previous video, in general, whatever instantiations you expect to do, do the existential ones first because they have restrictions on them. Then when you do the universal instantiations later, they are unrestricted and you don't have to be so concerned. Okay, here's a version of a universal resolution. For any x, either p or q. For any x, either r or not q. Therefore, for any x, either p or r. Of all of the various combinations of quantifiers that we could stick on forms of resolution, uh, this is one that bears particular uh, attention. And the proof is fairly straightforward. So again, we state our two givens. Here they are. We universally instantiate both of them, and since we're doing universal instantiation, we are going to go ahead and use the same variable for both. Of course, if I used different variables for lines 3 and lines 4, uh, that would probably be a bad idea because then I could not combine them in any way. Okay, now do recall we did have a version of resolution where p or q, r or not q, therefore p or r, and that's the version we're applying here with the variable a plugged into all of these statements. That's why we had to use the same variable for both universal instantiations. And now we can universally generalize line 5, replacing a's back with x's. Universal generalization requires you to be a bit careful. The free variable a that we have in line 5, where did it come from? It was not in any givens, and it only appeared by universal instantiation. Therefore, it can be generalized back to whatever variable we want, and we're going to go ahead and go back to x, because that's what we have as our final line here. Okay, again, universal generalization requires you to be careful. The free variable a only appeared through these two lines of universal instantiation. It never appeared in a given as a free variable, and it never appeared through existential instantiation. So it can be replaced through universal generalization. Here's a different version of universal resolution. Notice that the variables here are now different, and they're both doubly quantified. For any x or y, sorry, for any x and y, either p of x or q of y, 
for any w and z, either r of w or not q of z, therefore for any x and y, p of x or r of y. So let's begin by stating our two givens. Okay. Now we're going to universally instantiate both of them, but look at the variables. Okay, we have uh, statements p, q, r, not q. So when I do the universal instantiation, we're probably going to want to use the same variable for q in both of these, and that's what we're doing. Okay, we're replacing x with a and y with b to get p of a or q of b. Then we're instantiating w and z with c and b respectively. Specifically, we want the same variable b here. Because now I have two disjunctions, one of which has this statement, q of b, and one of which has this statement, not q of b. Since these are exactly the same statement, we can resolve them. p of a or r of c, and now we can universally generalize both of those variables. Because both of the variables a and c never occurred as a given, as a free variable, and were only introduced through universal instantiation, they can both be universally generalized to whatever variable we want. And because our uh, conclusion of our rule of inference involved x and y here, that's what we do. Okay, the variable rules for both existential and universal instantiation and generalization take a bit of getting used to, just remember, that it makes a lot of intuitive sense. Universal instantiation is very unrestricted because if something is always true, it is easy to say it is true for something in particular. But existential instantiation is a bit more tricky because if something is only true sometimes, you have to be careful about saying it's true for something in particular. Generalization is the opposite. If something happens to be true for something, it's easy to say sometimes it's true. But if something is true for a particular element, it's very, very difficult to get to the statement that it must always be true. So why are we taking a separate video just to talk about resolution? So in propositional logic, we had disjunctive normal form, okay, where we talked about this as a way to standardize how statements are presented. Any statement can be transformed into a logically equivalent version so that uh, distinguishing statements as logically equivalent or not is easily done just by comparing a list of symbols. We talked about disjunctive normal form because it was easy to relate it to a truth table. In reality, there's uh, something very, very similar called conjunctive normal form that's a bit more standard. So instead of talking about uh, disjunctions of elementary conjunctions, that's disjunctive normal form, Conjunctive normal form is a conjunction of elementary disjunctions. In predicate logic, there's a similar collection of techniques involving, and these things we're really not going to discuss, but they're called, if you want to look them up, variable standardization, scolemization, and unification. These are just sort of similar to the steps we went through in talking about disjunctive normal form as a way of making everything look the same. These are similar steps, but they involve predicate statements with quantifiers, and they're a bit trickier. But the point is, it gives a logically equivalent version of any predicate statement. And therefore, uh, you can compare statements easily. Now, this form generates only universal quantifiers and conjunctions of elementary disjunctions. That's kind of an unexpected result of these things, is that existential quantifiers can be completely chucked out the window. So universal resolution is a very helpful thing. If we're getting rid of all of our existential quantifiers, universal resolution is something that we want to pay particular care to, especially since we're talking about a conjunctive normal form and a bunch of elementary disjunctions. We want to be able to resolve them against one another. So that's why we took a moment to talk about resolution in particular. Uh, it's also just handy practice for generating two column proofs involving instantiation and generalization. but we're not really gonna talk about this standardized form of predicate statements.